Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's masterclass. My name is Mike Ast from HSS, and I'm really excited to talk tonight about when will robotics and navigation become the standard of care in joint replacements. And the reason we're talking about it is because the trends speak for themselves. We've seen a dramatic increase in the use of technology in both hip and knee replacements over the last couple of years. And while it's happening in the United States, it's also happening all over the world. In fact, 21% of members of the American Academy of the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons said that they use technology in their knee replacements in 2018 and greater than 30% of knee replacements get technology uh, across Australia. So I think it's not just uh, when's it going to happen, it's that it's happening right now. And our job is to kind of figure out uh, how it's all going to work out. And the reason it's happening is because we know that it works. Computer navigation for total knees reduces revision rates, especially in our highest demand patients and our youngest population, which also happens to be the population that's growing at the fastest rate across this country. And it's not only reducing revision rates, but even perioperative morbidity can be decreased with the use of technology in knee replacement surgery. And so it's got surgeons' attention, but guess what? It's also got the payers' attention. And they don't know what they're exactly how they feel about it, but they're certainly confused. Read this directly from the website of one of the largest payers in America. It says computer-assisted surgery is investigational, but then if you keep reading down, it also says that it's integral to the procedure. So clearly it might be investigational, it might be integral. I think what we're seeing is that new note at the bottom was added recently because what used to be investigational is now being considered integral to the surgery. And if it's integral to the surgery, that kind of answers our question at the beginning is when will this become standard of care? I think it's happening right now. And I'm super, super excited to talk about whether it's robotics or navigation, how this affects the practices of our panel uh, tonight and I want to introduce them. First, we'll start with Linda Suleman. She is an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern. She's also the assistant dean of medical education and the director of diversity inclusion. Uh, she trained at Northwestern after finishing medical school at Howard. And if there's anyone out there who doesn't know who Linda is yet, you definitely should. And I promise you, you will as uh, we move forward because she is an absolute shining, rising star in our field. On the, uh, the, our other panelist tonight is Corey Callendine. If you don't know who he is, just check TikTok. He is the chief of the Division of Orthopedic Surgery at Williamson Medical Center. Got, after getting his MD at the University of Tennessee Medical School, he did his residency at Vanderbilt and his fellowship at one of my favorite places, the Anderson Orthopedic Clinic. So Linda, Corey, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure, Mike. Good to be with you. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure, really. It's so excited to talk to this group because I think when you look across the country and you start to think about who's known for technology and knee replacements, this, I mean, the two of you are, are obviously people that are known and in the way that modern surgeons are known, not just because you publish a lot, not just because you work with industry, but look on social media and you're going to see it. And I think that goes to the power of technology, not just in surgery, but across across the world, the ability to democratize opportunities and access to education. And I think both of you are absolutely great examples of that. So really, it is absolutely my pleasure to have you. So let's, let's think about it for a second. Let's talk about it. Linda, what do you think is the role of technology in, in arthroplasty surgery today? And how, how do you use it? Do you use it all the time? So to talk us through your practice. Sure. So my experience, I'd say I'm probably relatively new. I'm about two years worth of pretty dedicated technological experience. My first time actually seeing any type of navigation was with one surgeon um, during fellowship. Um, and it was really just a couple cases. It wasn't um, a significant part of his practice. And what I realized going back to a teaching institution where, you know, we have 30 residents, we it flows um, and kind of delve deeper to how we teach orthopedics and just medical education in general, I found there was this kind of gap in understanding our learners today. And what I mean by that is, I'm sure Corey can maybe comment on this because he's probably a little bit older than I am, but back in the day, from what I hear- Way, way older, way <laughs> older, Linda, thank you. Back in the day, from what I hear, you know, it was a lot of, you know, doing cases, you're talking about kind of theoretically, this is how we release knees, These, this is kind of how we reconstruct pelvises and hips and revisions. And I remember like talking and teaching to my residents in clinic and in the OR, and they kind of had this blank stare looking at me. And it's like, we're, we're living past this whole, 
you know, feel this need? Does it feel looser? You know, this is the order of releases, you know, these things that to us, we read out of a book. I think this generation of learners needs some feedback. And we see that when it comes to feedback um, as educators, but we also see that as feedback in the case and understanding how do I change the mechanics of this knee or this hip to make it work? Um, and so for me, that was kind of the changing point of why I started using technology is because I needed to be able to teach my residents how to do a good knee and hip arthroplasty, both in real time, but also doing it from a simulation standpoint. So for me in my practice, I'm up to about 60% of my practice has some technology embedded into it. Um, and a lot of it has helped from the education side on the simulation level. So outside of the operating room, it's just really excelled how we understand the principles of hip and knee arthroplasty. I mean, I think that's so great. And it touches to the, to the entire spectrum of care that technology can, can get involved in. It's not just in the operating room, but before, but after. Corey, what, what about you? How, did you? how did you get started? How often do you use it? What does technology look like in your practice? Well, you know, like like Linda said, I'm I'm really old, and so you know, I I, I used to just use chisels. And uh, did no, you have it, hair then too, Corey? No, no, I didn't actually. <laughs> I, I came out this way, and um, no, no. Listen, listen. Certainly, there's been an evolution in my practice, no question. I, I think I think Linda brings up a very very good point about this next generation of surgeons. Uh, th these are the first surgeons that are like. Uh, digital natives, right? I mean, they're very comfortable with technology and, 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 and much more so than I was. So yeah, of course, I started standard instrumentation. I, I had very minimal exposure to technology in, in my fellowship at, there at the uh, Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute. R really, uh, I have seen that come along in my practice. And, and I think we're going to talk about that a little later is like, golly, where do you start? I, I think, Mike, it's about this for me. It's about as we evolve with joint replacement, we want better tools, right? And we want better information or better data uh, to, 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 to act on. And, and that's really, whether we're talking about robotics or navigation, and I think we should spend the next several hours talking about what's the difference between those two, you know, because we're, we're, we're kind of grouping them together. And I'm glad we are, because what we're really trying to emphasize is technology is there and available for better tools and better data. And how are we going to use them in our practice for better patient outcomes? The reality is, is the reason why we're talking about this is because outliers still exist, complications still exist, and all of us are trying to like solve that equation, right? And we're stepping away from this concept of uh, joint replacement is all about art, right? It, it is art. There, there's still things that are spiritual, right? There's still churches that we go to, right? Our training programs are it's kind of our- PCL, our, that's the art. That, that, that's right. That, that, that's it. That's a great point. Like, uh, but with technology, we'll be more objective about it, more scientific about it. And I think we all want that for our patients. So for me, that's the role of technology. In my practice, I use a ton uh, uh, of technology, probably in every case now, uh, it, it's touched by technology in some way. So it's really changed as I've gone through my practice. Corey, I think you made a really great point. Um, it just made me think of this when you talk about outliers. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about how technology can help that. And what I've also realized in some of the research we've looked at as from an access standpoint and an equity standpoint in total joint replacements, when we look at patients with complications, right, longer length of stay, readmission rates, we're seeing it from lower volume hospitals, which tend to be at locations that may or may not have fellowship trained joint replacement surgeons, one, to a lower volume of joints going in. And those hospitals tend to represent patients who are, are of color, people of color in this country mm -hmm. who we see these health disparities. So from the research we've looked at in access points, you know, can technology maybe help in the outlier standpoint and help these disparities and really close that gap? And that's something we haven't studied yet, but I think with the adoption of technology, we'll be able to answer some of these questions. And Rand Schwarzkopf and the NYU team looked at that in terms of preventable complications with the use of technology. And it was about 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent of, of post-operative complications would have been avoidable with the use of technology. So I think that's absolutely right, Linda. And you see it even more when you look at lower volume centers or centers without access to fellowship trained arthroplasty surgeons. 
So Corey, you, you mentioned something about the adoption, like sort of how, how you started and, and how it's going to happen across the board. What were some of the sort of hurdles you had to overcome and how did you start from where, you, from, from, you know, chisels yeah. and end at technology in every case? Like, what was that like? And any advice for, for surgeons who might be saying, well, or, or, or even administrators or hospitals, try to say, how are we going to integrate this into our practice? Well, sure. I, I mean, I think I think you have to start simple. What, what problem are we trying to fix? Right. What are we trying to fix? And, and you want to find those technologies that you can you can deploy. Obviously, there's a cost issue that we'll talk about here in a second. But also you want them to almost be incremental additions. Right. You, you want them to build on what we're already doing. And so if you're a surgeon out there or a healthcare system, I would say, OK, how, how can we take our current processes and kind of evolve onto that? You know, I, th I think several years ago, I, I, I trained as a posterior approach surgeon on the hip side. And, and, and I moved towards the anterior approach for the technology of C-arm, right? Uh, intraoperatively, right? So maybe, maybe that was it for me. You know, I, I could flip the patient flat and use a C-arm and, and, and now, now there's all kinds of tech around uh, C-arm technology on hip replacement, for example. Well, it's not so different in the knee world. Like the concepts that I learned in knee replacement are still there, but what? how am I going to leverage technology to make myself incrementally better? So, you, you know, for me, I, I, I've kind of leveraged some of the robotic side. I, I like the pre-planning piece and, you know, you know, anything thinking I can do outside the operating room is really, really good. I, I thought Linda made some great points about it being such a teaching opportunity outside the operating room. So I love that part of technology. How can I learn more about the case before I'm even in the case? Um, but but it really depends on what angle you're talking about. I think from a surgeon standpoint, you got to figure out what problem you're trying to solve and how can you incrementally get better and, and then find those technologies that you can employ. Now, we, we talked about cost and we kind of banged up against it a couple of times already. Ready. We talked about how if complications go up, obviously your cost goes up, right? So, so, so what are your what 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 are your fifty percent of the revisions, right? Fifty percent of the complications could be avoided by technology, and so sometimes you have to kind of break away from the silo concept of this is going to be more cost for the case. But again, what problem are you trying to solve and what money are you going to save down the road? So I think that's, you know, I don't know how much time you want to spend on that, but I think that's really important for health systems and C-suites to look at that we don't get too siloed. Linda, what do you think on the cost side? Because especially at a teaching hospital in a, in a you know, in a major city, costs are very different when you talk to a big academic institution versus when you talk to a smaller hospital, they're not better or worse. The conversation just tends to be a bit different. Sort of what what did you encounter? What did you find when you were in when you're starting to bring technology into your practice from a standpoint of cost, but also any other hurdles that you didn't expect or expected and didn't see? Yeah, I think for me, we had zero technology um, at the main campus. So I we own almost 11 hospitals in the state of Illinois, and I think the best way to get technology is actually coming in together as an entire health system. I think that was probably the easiest way instead of trying to negotiate a contract with one individual hospital, it was a lot easier for me to contact surgeons who were interested in this technology at our other affiliate hospitals and say, hey, how can we come together to deciding one or two, maybe three areas of technology is something that we'd be interested in. If you're at an academic institution, another way to really try to leverage some of that cost in contracting is actually partnering with the medical school or whatever institution you're affiliated with from a university standpoint. And so if it has to do with medical education, most academic hospitals have a department of medical education that can share in these costs with you because it's helping teach their residents, right? It's helping teach their medical students, helping them teach their fellows. So it's kind of the shared cost. If you can come in together, that's probably the biggest advice. Um, if you're at an academic hospital is you cannot do this alone as a single surgeon. You have to come in together, multiple hospitals if you're in a hospital system, but two, um, also partnering with the university. I think lastly is really making sure your team is excited to do this with you, excited to come on this journey. Um, and I think, what can happen is you say, hey, we're going to do start doing robots. You know, you have to make sure your staff are educated, trained to understand, you know, how the flow of doing a robotic procedure or a navigation type procedure will work. 
that also includes your residents. You know, we had labs before I even did my first um, robotic uh, knee replacement at my own institution. And lastly is checking in on that process. Is that process and protocol of how you're integrating the actual technology working? So for me, after that first month of launching the program, we met with the circulating nurses, the OR nurses, the anesthesia team. You know, how can we make the flow and incorporation of this technology even better and more seamless? And checking in every three months. Now we're about two years out, you know, we meet every quarter just to kind of re-engage, you know, issues we may or may have had. How can we make this process a lot easier for everybody on the team? You know, it's an interesting point, right? It brings up the value of simplicity and explaining the simplicity of technology, not just to your hospital, but to your team. So for instance, the fact that with most types of technology, you can dramatically decrease the number of trays you have in each case, decrease the setup time, right? Things like that uh, are not only valuable to you, they're valuable to your team, they're valuable to your hospital, they're valuable to an operating room. And I think the, the sort of the sell of those parts is, is something we forget about. The thing that I thought was the, the kind of the most amazing thing you said, did you say you got surgeons to work together? I think that's the first time I've ever heard that. Usually you put like five surgeons in room, you get like nine ideas. I can't believe it. Good for you. It's amazing. I don't know. You gotta, offline, you got to tell me how you did that. That's pretty unbelievable. That, it's a woman's that is touch, a, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, Mike and I don't have that. I don't think. I haven't seen it either. It was amazing. Um, but But listen to what we're talking about so much is as we introduce these new technologies, these robotic and navigation platforms, the emphasis on education, right? On training, like how cool is that? And we don't think so narrowly about just the surgeon. We think about the team. And, and I have seen in my practice a lot of benefit from that level of training. You know, Linda was talking about adding uh, technology uh, into an academic center. You know, I, I practice in a community hospital and also an ASC that, um, you know, I, 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 I partner in. And so, you know, it really comes down to you need to believe in what you're doing because that there there is a cost to it sometimes but if you believe in what you're trying to accomplish and you're willing to track it again i think the emphasis on leveraging these companies to help us educate our teams and help us uh, get better for our patients i, I don't think that could be uh, overstated and and of course you had to go and do it but you said the word asc oh. now now i'm in now now now's the conversation <laughs> i'm excited about yeah. so but let's let's talk about that right because i think there is some, there is a lot of sort of talk out there of, okay, well, I like technology and I can convince my hospital to get technology, but how am I going to bring that technology to my surgery center? And even the academic medical centers have surgery centers, right? I think, you know, we used to think of ambulatory surgery centers as, you know, the private practices, they owned a small surgery center. And that was the way it was in the eighties and nineties before Linda was born when Corey and I started practicing. But, uh, but, you know, now you look, some of the biggest health systems in the country have 10 or 15 surgery centers. There's a, there's a center in New Jersey that's got 27 surgery centers within their health system, right? This is, this is a reality for healthcare systems and private practices alike. So Corey, how do you, what do you do with that? How do you integrate, if you're a technology believer, yeah. how do you integrate technology both at the hospital and at the center? And do you ever think of, is it different? Is it the same? Is there, are there different considerations? Well, I, I mean, I, you know, listen, it is a different way to practice medicine and the cost structure is different. And my, Mike, I know you've done a lot of work in this space around the business of ASCs. There is a business element of this that we should just speak to very clearly. And, um, you, you know, in the sense that we want to be sustainable in order to give good access to our patients. I'm very, very thankful to have the same kind of technology at my hospital as I do at the ASC, but but that came from a cash investment. And, and, and for us, it was, a new ASC center. So we, you know, we partnered in, in, in ways uh, with, with, with the company on growth, you know, overall volume growth. Listen, I do not do technology, never have, never will do technology to attract more patients, but I think we've already touched on it that people are finding this technology, patients are interested, and there is this element of practice growth that has to be balanced. I mean, again, that's not my motivator, but it's certainly a benefit that makes the cost structure work. Linda, what do you think as you start to think of expanding, you know, you've got your main central hospital, but your health system, like every other health system is expanding when you're opening new hospitals, when you're opening smaller centers, when you think about expanding out into the community, do you think about sort of how you're going to 
how you're going to bring technology with you? And do you ever think of using the same technology, different technology? How, how do you kind of think of it? Yeah, so we're actually opening up um, our first um, ambulatory surgery center mm -hmm. next fall. And so we started the planning and it, it was amazing to me how the, the first question was also, you know, what type of technology are we bringing here? So it's already in the mind um, of our hospital administrators because we've had such a successful program across our health system. Um, but it's really because we're building from ground up, you know, it's really making us kind of think about, do we use the same technology do, that we're currently using at the main hospital? Do we change to a navigation base or robotic base, um, whatever it may be. Um, and it's a different community entirely that I'm currently not serving. So really understanding what type of access I'm trying to gain at the um, ASC, I think will be really helpful in planning the type of technology. But to me, it really just amazed me from the conversations I had two years ago when I first came and said, you know, I want to, <laughs> I want to use technology in my practice to now you're telling me, what are we bringing into the ASC? Um, I think it just shows where the trend um, and conversations are happening from the administrative level. And it is interesting because it used to be like an immediate no. They're like, oh, you want to spend money? Yeah, that's not happening. Right. <laughs> and it is fascinating to kind of watch how that how that's changed a little bit now Corey your hospital do you see that too I mean I know you're ASC that you're in charge and I that's kind of the thing I like about ASCs we always say that surgeons are in charge so you think that 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 the decisions are going to be made based on whatever you think is best but I've I got to tell you I found a lot of administrators a lot more open to the conversation in the last year uh, sort of similar to what Linda's saying do you see it too well I, I absolutely see it you know I, I benefited from our hospital was one of the first to bring in Da Vinci, you know, this soft tissue uh, robotic system that's so popular now. So, so they understood that from a hospital growth perspective. I'm in a community hospital. So th they understood the, stood the growth side. But yes, I think C-suites now understand that there's a patient demand for it. And look, we, we, we all want to be known as those people who are doing our very, very best for each and every patient. That's really what technology is bringing, right? Better tools, better data, but we can personalize it to that individual patient, right? We have, we, we, we don't have just a chisel anymore. And so I think that message is really coming across at, at, at all levels. And yeah, now, now, now they, they push me, uh, which is great. And Linda, when you're talking to some, some of your, some of your trainees who are going to go out and practice, do you, mm -hmm. do you talk to them at all about sort of how they're, how they can approach their new practices or approach their new hospitals? Do you talk to them all about sort of their desire for the adoption of technology or how they can accomplish that goal? No, absolutely. We have this conversation kind of all the time because I think for us, a lot of our, my trainees who don't do a joint fellowship have very much solid plans to be doing total joint replacements and wanting to do this. Um, you know, I, I talk a little bit about, there's a little bit of work on the front end from the surgeon perspective. And for me, the very first time I went, it was a flat out no. I mean, this is expensive. Um, so what I actually did was um, I was really friendly with our kind of call center folks and I gave them a presentation on robotics and they kept asking me like, why don't we do it here? I was like, that's a great question. So we started tracking it. So we started tracking the number of patients who um, asked to have some sort of robotic or technology, navigation, whatever it may be, procedure, and I was able to prove we were losing 8% of new patient visits. And so if you're in a Chicago metropolitan area, you don't want to see patients leaving the health system, right? And you don't want so to see it anywhere. You don't see it anywhere. Um, but from an administrative standpoint, that's money they're losing from a, a variety of aspects. There's a lot of orthopedics, but we don't realize is the power that we have from the standpoint of we see new patients come to see us. That's a patient who may need a cardiology visit. That's a patient who may need a preoperative endocrinologist or a primary care doctor, whatever it may be. That's business coming in because they're coming in from musculoskeletal problem. We're getting them ready for surgery. We may need other clearances to happen and we're bringing those patients in. And so to me, if you can figure out, you know, what's going to drive your administration, you can be really thoughtful in how you gather and present that information. And so for me, I, I, I had patients telling me, why don't you guys do this here? And so just being able to track it and say, this is the number, this is the percentage of people we're losing, um, I think really started at least allowing the conversations to start. 
That's that that's interesting how the market has shifted and you've been able to prove that. I, I'm curious, you, you you all training residents and fellows, when, when they go out to get jobs, like are they looking for technology where they land? I, I assume that's got to be, I, I don't get to talk to a lot of those guys as they're searching for uh, their first job. But I, I got to believe it works the other way too, is that's a way for healthcare systems to, to attract new surgeons, I would think. Are you seeing yeah, that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think yeah, we're Linda. seeing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, certainly our uh, residents and fellows who go out, I think, have a very similar uh, thought process to what Linda was saying. That they even our non arthroplasty surgeons are planning on doing arthroplasty because there's just so much out there to do. A lot of our sports trained colleagues, you know, still like to do total knees. And back to the data, right? The if they're not going to be super high volume, they recognize the value of adding technology to their practice. And a lot of them are saying, look, if there is technology there, that's great. That's like a big win for them. But many of them are also saying, well, if not, here's the list of A, B, and C technologies that I've had exposure to that I feel comfortable with that I think I'm going to try to bring with me when I get there. So, uh, you know, we, we say sometimes it's helpful for getting uh, patients. I also think for healthcare systems or for even practices or ASCs, having technology is helpful for recruiting surgeons. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think so there, there's a win across the board with the larger adoption of, of technology. So I'm going to throw a real curveball at you for, for the, the teaching side of it, Linda. So last week we had grand rounds and a surgeon in my hospital who is extraordinarily famous, former president of everything, who does not use technology in his practice, said, at some point, I'm concerned that if you don't use technology, it will be a liability. You'll get sued for the dislocation. You'll get sued for the unbalanced knee. He was being a bit controversial in the conversation, but Linda, do you think there's, I mean, Chicago's not quite as bad as New York and Philly, but there are a lot of lawyers there too. Has anyone ever thought about that or said it? I thought it was a bit much even for a technology believer, but it was an interesting comment. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I would have gone that far. Um, <laughs> that's really um, quite extreme. I do think that we're, we're seeing the trends for people wanting it. And it's almost like it, patients will start to ask, well, why didn't I have it? And, you know, patients, you can have a complication doing the best procedure possible. Anything could happen. Um, and patients wonder, well, what went wrong? Even as a surgeon, nothing actually went wrong in that case is just, you know, sheer luck. But I think that from that standpoint of being sued, I'm not sure we're quite there. I do believe that patients are going to start to ask why it wasn't done or why it wasn't offered. Well, and look, I, I think what's so beautiful is it's, it's probably the surgeon that wants to do the best job that they absolutely can. I think that's what brings all the three of us together, right? I, I, I doubt any of us worry daily about the litigious side of it uh, because the reality is, is nobody cares more about that patient in front of us uh, that, that, than we do. But, but, but I guess, I guess something like that could happen. What, once we prove out, right, it's gotta be simple. It's gotta be easy to use. It's gotta be, you know, cost effective. And, and Linda's brought up some great points about making sure it's available to everyone, right? Surgeon and patients. Uh, but once we get to that point, I think all of us will want to do it because it's better, right? It's, it, it's proven to be better. I think that's where we're heading. And, and I, I think as we see it in our trainees and we see the adoption from our trainees, I think that's the proof, right? The fact that they want to all go out and use it, the patients are asking for it. I think we're, we really are starting to see that. Corey, do you think if, so this is that, this is the digital age, right? And we're looking forward now, these, all our trainees coming through, all our new physicians coming through are very tech savvy. Do you think there's a, a value to like, it, would it be bad if a resident finished residency and never did a manual case, never did a case without technology? Like, are we still obligated to teach manual techniques to trainees? 
Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I think the concepts are probably better learned in the tech world. That's the reality of it due, due to simulation or, you know, things like that, that Linda was referencing earlier. So, so I think technology is an incredibly powerful teaching tool. Uh, are we obligated to show them manual instruments? You know, I do some op walk work, you know, I and mean, we don't have technology in Honduras. Uh, I think, I think there's merit to manual instrumentation, of course. Uh, and I think at least you have to understand it. I don't think manual instrumentation is so difficult to be quite honest. And so I think it should be entertained and available. What if the power goes out? Out. Isn't that what everybody always says? Like th these next generation, they're going to be totally worthless. Well, if they understand the concepts of joint replacement, and again, I think that can be learned a lot better in the tech world for a hundred different reasons, depending on which procedure we're talking about. Uh, yes, I think having manual instruments still available is okay, but I don't think that's really a, 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 a big leap. I think the reality is, is manual techniques will always be there for whatever reason, be it indigent, third world care or, um, you know, if the power goes out. But, but again, I think the emphasis has to be on if you understand the concepts, if you understand the concepts of arthroplasty, then, then it's what's the best tool I can use in order to execute it. What do you think, Linda? You're of the digital age a little more than at least Corey and I. Do, do, I, do I have to make sure that my residents can or my fellows can do uh, manual instruments only, which by the way, I don't do any, and I don't do any hips or any knees or any knee revisions without technology. Do you think I'm doing a disservice to my trainees or is this a like blip on the radar until, at, until the point where every single surgeon and every single patient has access to technology? So what I love about that, question is I, people assume if you don't teach manual instrumentation that you're not teaching the human expertise and the critical thinking that's required of a hip and knee replacement. I think that's what people assume when you say I'm not teaching anything manual. Now for me personally it's still 30 percent of my practice and why I have a there is just for a variety from an education standpoint i like variety being able to have my residents do manual and some sort of robotic or navigation i think it just adds to them seeing something different but from a human expertise and critical thinking it's still required whether you do a manual knee or a robotic knee or a navigation assisted knee it's still there and very much present and so the assumption is what kills me is that people think that just because you have a robot or just you have a navigate, you almost need more critical thinking, in my opinion, more. Yeah, and the way I look at it is you have critical thinking and then you actually do what you think you're going to do. You don't get kind of close and hope it works out. But I am a, definitely a lot biased in this world. All right, so that brings us to the final question. Linda, we're going to start with you. It was on the first slide of the night. When do you think navigation or robotics of technology of some kind will become the standard of care in joint replacements? Aetna thinks it's already. I don't really always believe Aetna. So what do you think? Personally, I think we are there. I think it is going to be, it is, we are here today. It's a standard of care. And I think that from a patient standpoint, we should deliver the best possible care we can deliver. And I think that's what technology and robotics is. Rory? Uh, I mean, just to be adversarial, I'm going to say 2027 is what I'm going to say. And, and that's when the legal cases are going to start. No, no, Linda brings up the perfect point. Now is the time and there are enough options, right? We, we've talked around costs. There's a wide range of costs. We've talked, uh, you know, kind of um, informally here, robotics, navigation, all this kind of stuff. I think the reality is, is there are enough options that everyone can participate in what I think is this digital evolution. So are, are we in the digital age? We absolutely are for all the reasons that we've talked about tonight. We should all be looking into it as a way to get better. Is there one solution? Is there one mandate? Is there only one way to do it? Not yet. But honestly, I hope as we objectify it, we figure out which ones work and which ones don't. But are we in the digital age today? Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it really does go back to achieving the goals that every surgeon walks into the room to do. You want to do the best job for the best patient for every patient 
in every setting across the board. And so once there is technology for all of the different implants, technology that works at each different site of service, you can democratize access to quality care and democratize access to, edu to quality education. And I think that's the key, right? Once we achieve that, that defines what should be the standard of care. So I, I totally, totally agree with both of you. I think th those sentiments were absolutely great. Um, I do thank you both so much uh, for your thoughts uh, for, for this portion of it. And I think uh, at this point, we'll go ahead and open it up to our Q&A and allow, uh, allow uh, anyone uh, watching or online here with us today to uh, get their questions answered. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to thank you again for, uh, for that, that, great, uh, that great session. I mean, I think a lot of people uh, heard a lot of things they agreed with, a lot of things they had some more questions about. And I'm really excited that some of our, uh, some of our listeners and attendees tonight have sent in some questions. So I'm going to kind of rapid fire some of these to, to both of you, and let's, uh, and let's see sort of where, where the conversation takes us. So uh, the first thing we talked, the first thing I heard mentioned here a couple of times that technology is great, but again, they hit back onto Corey some of your, your conversations on cost. Right, the upfront cost versus the per case cost versus the uh, differences that you see between different technological platforms. Corey, how, how do you look at that when you compare things like some of these robotic platforms with large upfront capital costs to some of these single use per case costs like, uh, like handheld navigation, like, like the Orthline Lantern or some of the augmented reality systems like the Medact AR system? How do, you, how do you view that? What are your thoughts there? Well, I mean, cost, th thanks, Mike. Co cost is a major consideration. I think now that we're at the time that physicians have to be, surgeons have to be involved in that discussion. So most of us want to run from it. I want to use what I want to use. But we really have to lean into that. And we have to make sure that our programs remain viable, right? So if we're a suck to the system and, you know, our cost structure and what we utilize is not sustaining the system, then obviously that's a real that's a real challenge. My hospital did invest, uh, you know, in a capital purchase. Now, trying them to get that is uh, trying to get them to do that is a, is a huge challenge. But I thought you you brought up a really good point, which is about it's not just a capital cost in these programs, but it's also the ongoing cost, the cost per case. And so I, I think it's just a really individual discussion about how that works within your system. I can tell you for us, it's forced us to be more careful with some of the disposables that we use per case. Oh, we would quit opening extra this or extra that, and we're able to save a lot of money during the case. So actually what it has done for us, this discussion around cost, has made us more careful with what we're already using. Linda, what do you think? When you, when you look at some of these, especially the other thing is to consider the, the breadth of the platform of the technology. So some of these have an upfront cost and only do knees or only do unis or only do hips. Or, like, what, do you, what do you think? Do you think there's also some consideration within those costs, whether they're capital or per case, on sort of the breadth of the ability of that technology? Yeah, that was actually a big part of the initial negotiation um, when we got a robot was, you know, it's used from the standpoint of knees and hips. Can we use it in as many cases as possible? Um, so that definitely was a big part of it. Um, and I think the other aspect is, you know, what are the pre-op imaging um, you need? So some platforms need none, some need CT scans. Um, Interestingly enough, the hospital liked the idea of pre-op imaging in some form because it was obviously, you know, coming into their budget of image use. So it really depends on, I think as a surgeon, um, if you don't already sit on some of these committees or at least being a part of these discussions and understanding the finance and understanding where these costs are really implicated, um, I think that's where I would start. But the biggest thing was I, it made me reevaluate what am I currently using in my cases and what does that cost? Because honestly, I was kind of coming in pretty ignorant at a fellowship and coming to an academic place where everything's there and can use whatever I want. Um, but being able to really highlight, okay, do I really need this Aquamanus every case? Do I really need um, this suture every case? Um, really helped um, navigate the conversation and that negotiation. And it's interesting because it, I actually had the exact opposite experience where I worked with one hospital uh, at one point in my career that was trying to use an image-based uh, technology platform, and they kept getting the images denied. 
the insurance companies from the area were denying coverage for the imaging platform. And so the hospital had to make a budget decision. Do we do the imaging for free and utilize the platform we paid for or don't do the imaging and not utilize the platform? And they ultimately ended up doing the imaging for free, which was a loss for them. And I think that is one of the challenges we see in the regional variation coverage for some of this imaging and also some of the advantages in some circumstances of imageless platforms. Um, I, I think in, in, it just keeps things a little simpler sometimes um, in, in that situation. So I'm just sorry, I'm going to keep scrolling through some of these, uh, some of these, uh, these things. So what about, uh, what about, we talked about patients really being, coming interested in, uh, in technology. And Linda, I think you did a, I mean, your explanation of it is amazing to notice you're losing 10% of patients because you're not utilizing technology. It's pretty wild for a healthcare system. Um, and, and there's definitely good opportunities for educating surgeons on technology. But how do you, what's the best way to go about at, uh, educating the community? Like, are, do you have programs or do you have ways out there? Have you seen uh, opportunities to educate the community? I guess we'll, we'll start with Corey. To educate the community around the value of technology? Well, I mean, for us, I mean, we, we're, we're the ones that should be the one educating, right? We're, we're all frustrated that they went to Dr. Google, but, you know, when was the last time, you, you know, you stepped forward and explained it to them? So I, I really think it's a calling for us now. And, you know, I, I've enjoyed um, some space digitally there in the social media world trying to educate. Look, you can do it digitally if that's your thing. But listen, every – well, when, when we brought robotics here, every month we had a community seminar at the local – Shoney's or whatever it was and invited them in. I, I think the emphasis there has to be your patients are going to be educated about tech. Who do you want them to educate, uh, it be, to be educated by? And, you know, for me, I think uh, I would want to be that one to educate. But it takes work. Linda, have you, have you done anything like that? Have you done any educational work or, or, or known of any educational opportunities that are out there for patients? Yeah, so we actually have a community outreach uh, program where we target certain areas that may not have – we look at the volume of total joint fellowship trained surgeons in that area. And so we try to partner from a musculoskeletal standpoint, especially if we don't have a basis or a, a clinic or a hospital in that area. And interestingly enough, we, mainly we're targeting kind of the high school, middle school, college-age students in that area um, for an interest in just orthopedics, right? And I just had a patient who came in to see me who was a parent of one of those students asked me about technology because their kid came home and said, oh, my God, I just did this robotic knee replacement, this demo. And so I think the discussion is there. I also think medicine has generally changed in the sense of it used to be, I think, this is very paternalistic. You come in, you, the doctor says we're going to do X, Y, Z, and you kind of go along with it. I mean, I've never had that where a patient comes in and they kind of want to dictate and be a part of this shared decision-making, and a lot of that is the upfront of, of the research. So although they're going to Google, I think really in these big community settings, whether it's churches, community centers, it has to come from the surgeon. So I definitely agree with Corey that it has to come from us and what that explanation means and not pamphlets or flyers. I just want to point out that Linda agreed with me. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. I just, just in case it never happens again. Yeah, I say don't, if don't we can just That's why that. this is recorded, Corey. Yeah, if we could just get that documented. <laughs> so, all right, switching topics here. Uh, another question we have is uh, I think a lot of people understand the room for improvement in knees. There's the, there's the constant quoting of the Bob Bourne article that was written before Linda was born. Uh, that 20% of knees are unhappy. That was, by the way, redone in Chicago not that long ago, and it was only about 9% of patients. So, uh, you know, I, we like using 20 when we're trying to prove something. We say 9 when we're talking to ourselves. It's somewhere in there. But on the hip side, do, do, does the panel, do you, do you both think that technology is the standard of care in hips as well? Linda, how about, what do you think? So I actually find it more useful in hip cases, personally, for me. Um, I remember going to AUKUS two, three years ago, and I started talking about spinal pelvic, and me just sitting there kind of dumbfounded, like, I just will not understand this topic. I'm just going to do dual mobility and whatever I don't understand and call it a day. Um, and I think for me personally, 
the technology, you know, I'm really lucky that I have an EOS machine. Um, so I'm able to get these sit standing films and how we apply it through technology and be able to take some of these angles and understanding how that actually affects our cut positioning, how it affects dislocation rates. I think that's one aspect, you know, we, we look at the Linux paper that was done at Requester, you know, 30 years ago, you know, our, these, those numbers don't even stand anymore. And as we're seeing patients, you know, as hip and knee arthroplasty is growing, so is lumbar fusion, so are, you know, degenerative spine disease. Um, so we as hip surgeons need to be able to personalize this surgery for our patients. Um, when it comes to prior surgeries or deformities and really understanding this cup is not always going to go into this in the same anniversion, the same abduction in every single patient. And I think that's where um, technology has the biggest impact. And Corey, I also think, you know, it's something that comes down to your definition of technology. I think you made a great point earlier where the technology that has driven a lot of the anterior approach world is fluoro. But that's technology. That is different than what people were traditionally doing in their Harding approaches or their approaches with a patient done in a lateral position. They couldn't get an x-ray. So whether it's fluoro, whether it's uh, navigation, whether it's robotics, I think the broader you define technology, would you agree that that actually almost makes this a simpler argument that hips, that in hips technology is the standard? Yeah, I mean, I think the question is, is better possible? And, and, and I deeply believe it is, just like Linda's saying, we have a better understanding of hip spine. As we understand it better, our targets for that individual patient get more narrow, and we need something to execute that. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit like, and listen, I, we're having this discussion to be very critical about tech and where it is in our space but, but the reality is, is just because, you know, the old rotary phones work didn't mean we didn't try to do something new and different. So I hope this discussion is not, hey, jump on the newest, uh, freshest, you know, sexiest, most expensive thing. I hope this is instead a conversation around, you know, this world is moving and, and better really is possible in a lot of different ways. And we surgeons need to be the leader of where this is going. And personally, I guess uh, I'll take a little liberty and answer a little bit on, on my own just to kind of keep going with that is that, you know, we talk about in knees, we want to do our alignment different. We want to do this a little different. We're going to get to kinematic alignment in a second. But in hips, there, we do know there are still basically three problems, infections, fractures, and dislocations. And in these, our data is a little shot, it's shoddy, right? It's a little hard to, to determine did that alignment really help that patient. Or in hips, when you look at it, the traditional dislocation rate for a posterior approach hip over the last 20 or 30 years was somewhere between 1% and 2%. And our current dislocation rate in technology-assisted hip replacements is 0.2%, right? The data is real. We need to prevent dislocations. Technology, in addition to Linda's points on understanding hip spine and, and really getting down into the personalized positioning of implants, I think it's absolutely proven that it works for achieving an actual goal we need to do. So, uh, that I, again, I, total, I absolutely think that technology of one kind or another uh, is absolutely the standard of care in hips. And, and, and I think a lot, a lot of people would agree with that, especially when it comes to leg length. And, and cup position. All right, so again, we're going to totally flip topics because I brought up there a second ago. We had a couple questions on back to knees, kinematic alignment. The idea of, um, but I, I, I don't love that term because I think it's been a bit bastardized. We'll call it alternative alignment strategies. Mm -hmm. Linda, what do you think about some of these alternative alignment strategies? And I want you to answer that part of the question really quickly and then like, do you think they're achievable without technology? So I do think there's a role for, for alternate strategies of mechanical or kinematic alignment, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I came from the mantra of soft tissue release, soft tissue release, soft tissue release. Um, I think one of the Q&A questions was from one of the Rush fellows. Um, and you really, this alternative alignment is growing. So I think there's a huge role for it. I think the best way to do it is with technology. Corey? 
Yeah, I think it's all about personalization. And I, I think if it hasn't been already, it's going to be overused, that term, you know, individualizing the plan for the patient. But that is only relevant if you have technology. Because so, if all you have is a metal rod to shove into the femur and a cutting block that's five or six or seven, you don't know where the metal rod is anyway. So, um, you know, make as many guides as you want. So I, I think as we, you know, that was my point, is as we're getting more data, as we're learning more about that individual patient, it is going to take tech to execute. You know, and Moby brought it up a little bit in the uh, Q&A about the extensive data you would require to create the algorithm to start making personalized alignment decisions, right? So where does Corey's knee belong? Where does Linda's knee belong? Is going to need a million Corys and a million Lindas before we actually get there. But the way I look at it is I agree we've got to do that and we've got to gather that data. But we there's no point in trying to execute that if you don't actually know where you're putting anything. But if you don't have if you don't have technology driving that surgical decision, that surgical execution, what's the point of having the data? So I think especially as we go, exactly like Linda said, especially as you go to those alternative alignment strategies, the more narrow the target the, the, the better the uh, rifle needs to be. Well, and just to put a nail into that, I think it's why we still argue about mechanical versus kinematic, because we were talking about mechanical with manual instrumentations and kinematic with manual instrumentations, and we weren't able to make the comparison. Now, we can. But as we have tech, we're like, hmm, maybe there's something in the middle here. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think that, I, I, it, shockingly, we're all on the same page on that one. Uh, but, uh, all right, I'm going to jump again a little bit different. Let's talk about some of the different platforms that are out there. Uh, I, I'm trying to keep this fairly uh, company agnostic as much as possible just to try to make it as educational for everybody involved. But there are some differences in some of the tech out there. And one of the things we hear a lot about are sort of the, 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 the single vendor platforms versus some of these more open platforms, right? There's uh, there many of the – uh, surgical robots or the patient-specific instrumentation type technology is for one implant, for one inch, for one company, whatever. Uh, some of the na navigation systems like uh, OrthoLine, like some of the other handheld systems, like uh, what we're hearing now is going to be this uh, new surgical robot in the future, um, are meant to be more open platform. What do you think about, Linda, do you think there's sort of pros or cons to closed platform versus open platform systems? Well, I think when you go back to trying to get surgeons to agree on things, uh, the whole closed platform is going to be one of those sticking points. You know, it's hard to get, unless you're at a single vendor institution, getting everybody on board. So I think where things are going to move is probably hospital surgery centers may have one version of some sort of open platform. I think, sadly, I don't know if it's going to be the robotic side from the capital purchase. I think it's more so going to be navigation tech forward, just from a cost-effective standpoint, being able to use that across the board. Um, but I do still think the closed platform systems are going to be here to stay. Um, I haven't, from the, from the discussions I've had on the hospital side, um, I haven't seen the robotic standpoint taking off yet. But from the navigation standpoint, open platform, I think, is going to be here. And that's how all surgeons are going to be able to come together to be able to use technology for patients without having to sacrifice their own personal choice on implants. Anything to add to that, Corey? That was like a shrug of, yeah, she's right. I don't want to say anything, so Look, don't tell me. Open I, I, I am a little bit afraid of it. Oh, open platform is amazing, and I'm just not sure how we're going to make that happen. I, I, I would tell you this. There are closed platforms that have – implants with long history of data and closed platforms that do not. I still think the implant is relevant. I just want to, you know, state that pretty clearly. Um, so, you know, I, I really struggle with those surgeons who, you know, jump on a technology without belief in the, in the implant because I do think the implant is important. I think it's fair for us to mention that tonight. Yeah, and, and again, I will highlight, I'm, I'm pretty sure OrthoLine is, uh, is sponsoring tonight, and they are an, an open platform navigation system. The other thing that uh, when you're going into the into the knee side, is we got a question here at the bottom in relation to knees. We've talked a lot about uh, varus valgus and overall alignment. But what about femoral rotation and gap balancing? Um, do, I personally, I think many surgeons who were trained as traditional measured resection surgeons 
when you start giving them technology, start to go and become gap balancers or some hybrid version of them. Corey, how were you originally trained? Were you a gap balancer, a measure a section, a blend of the both to begin with? Yeah, I mean, gap balance is the correct way to do it. Is that your question, Mike? I'm sorry, you cut out. You, that, uh, yeah, that's, that's really all I needed to hear. Okay, thanks. I agree. Thank you. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is how I trained. And so for me, when I started introducing tech and really being critical about rotation to match my balance, look, maybe the, th- this, is a, this is something we can argue about later. You know, the lateral side, maybe it should be a little bit looser than the medial side. You know, there's some arguments that say, oh, yeah, that's how it normally is. And then there are other guys that say, yeah, but we're not making a normal knee. We're making a kinem- uh, you know, an artificial knee. So we don't even know that. But again, just like kinematic and, and, and mechanical alignment, now that we have tech to hit our target, we can start to have that answer uh, objectively stated. Linda, have you always been a traditionally a gap balancing surgeon, or do you find that technology, as you've adopted over the last two years or so, has changed that at all? You know, I think I was probably more hybrid initially starting practice, and I think technology has really gotten me to this gap balancing. It's also changed kind of my flow of surgery. You know, I've always been distal femur, proximal tibia, um, and now I'm tibia first, which, you know, if you told me three years ago I'd be doing tibia first, you know, I'd be like, you're crazy. Um, but it's really changed my flow. Um, it's also changed how much I appreciate from gap balancing, um, and, it, it, you know, you follow these patients, and you kind of see where patients are, are happiest. Um, and that's where I've seen technology be of most use because I, I know it's going to be um, that measured um, gap. Great. And, and I will, again, I'll take that one second to highlight that, you know, the new Orthline Lantern system does have a beautiful gap balancing system. And I will obviously have to tell everybody that since I designed it, I should probably disclose that. Uh, but uh, but, it is, but I do I do think you're right, and I think I was a traditional measured resection trainee, a measured resection PS surgeon trained at HSS the way we've all been for the last 7,000 years since bones were invented. Um, but uh, but technology has absolutely driven me much more towards a gap balanced CR knee um, in a lot of situations. And I just think because to both of your points, right, you, you realize that you can make some adjustments with the right technology balance your ligaments, get your rotation correctly, you don't do as many releases, patients seem a little bit happier, and when you've got technology, you can alter that, you can alter your alignment targets and your rotation targets, and, and probably uh, probably have some fun with that. So the last thing I want to hit on, uh, because I think we're starting to get the hook here, but the last thing I want to hit on is, um, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the continuum of technology. So not just in the operating room, but beforehand and after. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't want to take us way off our initial conversation. But, like, what are your thoughts on some of these uh, virtual reality, augmented reality platforms that are out there for both training and surgical planning and execution? Do you think this is sort of a part of the future as we look at technology 10 or 15 years from now? Uh, I guess we'll start with Linda. Because she's going to be practicing a lot longer than Corey and I. <laughs> I think um, it's definitely developing. I think it's the future. I'm really excited about it from a training aspect. Again, I think you need to make sure our trainees understand what we're planning on doing preoperatively. I think that's, again, where technology has really helped is that, pre- that pre-op, pre-teaching aspect. Um, I also just want to make sure that if you're going to use that for your cases, that it's still a very much interactive procedure. So, you know, I've seen surgeons use it. It's just them and everybody else around is kind of staring at them. So it's making sure that it's still a collaborative procedure, I think, is going to be key. But I think it's here to stay. I'm, I'm really excited to see its development. Yeah, we're, we're training surgeons now that are, are digital natives. Uh, Linda may very well be in that category, not me. I mean, you know, we had a bag phone in the car. And so I, I, I think there's no question that they will be leveraging Virtual reality, I think Linda's point about collaboration is so important. I've been inside those virtual windows. I mean, I can be, I can be here, somebody else can be in, you know, China, and we can jump in the same virtual space. There's a great opportunity for collaboration, not only as you train, but also as you're, you know, out practicing, not only nationally and internationally. And augmented reality for me is all about execution. I think that type of technology is going to make these tools more intuitive. So. I think, 
I think that's great. Um, I, again, I, I want to thank uh, both of you so much for this. I want to thank Orthopedics uh, this week and Orthline for allowing us to have this conversation. I thank you to all of our attendees. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, but I just want to think that's because Corey and Linda are so engaging. They're just people want to hang out with you forever. So hopefully some of the people here will come join us at AUKUS or whatever the next meeting we're all going to be at. And feel free to stop Corey and Linda and take as much of their time as you want. They are not very busy. Um, totally true. So don't, so don't worry about it at all. Um, but really, Linda, Corey, thank you so much for joining me tonight. This was, this was, I hope you guys had fun. This was a lot of fun for me. Uh, and I hope everyone has a great night. It was great, Mike. Thanks, Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks for having us. It was awesome.